Let's move on to look at some of the other components here. So the blood vessels, we've got the heart. And if you really look at the histology of the heart, the heart develops as a blood vessel. It starts developing as a blood vessel and then it eventually swells into this larger chamber, um, which is what we know as the heart. So the heart essentially can be considered a really large complex blood vessel. Then we've got arteries, which are intermediate vessels, arterioles, which are slightly smaller, and then capillaries, which are the very smallest, tiniest vessels in the body. From there, we've got venules, which are really tiny veins, and then veins, which are bigger uh, tributaries that come back to the heart. Um, so if we kind of just go through here describing the function of each of these components, arteries are large, branching, they're moving away from the heart. Um, while we want to think about them as having um, oxygenated blood, that is not the truest description of an artery. Arteries are not necessarily what type of defined by what type of blood they have, but the best description of an artery is its direction in relation to the heart. This is why if we look at the pulmonary arteries, for example, although they are called arteries, they're actually carrying deoxygenated blood back to the lungs. So the truest definition of an artery is a vessel that is moving blood away from the heart. Okay, and not necessarily what type of blood it contains. This is true for veins as well. So veins are always bringing blood back to the heart and not necessarily always carrying deoxygenated blood. Um, other vessels are the arterioles. These have the highest resistance. We'll talk about this next semester as well, but arterioles are really important for creating the vascular resistance, which is what gives us our blood pressure readings. Um, capillaries are gonna be the very tiniest vessels. These are where that exchange can happen. And so it's really important for capillaries to have a very small, thin wall to allow for that exchange. Venules are simply smaller veins that will then converge to bring blood back to the heart. Okay, now we want to remind ourselves that the vascular system is a closed system. What does closed system mean? Um, closed system, just to jump back here, means that the blood is moving in a continuous circulatory fashion. So there is no blood leaving the system and there's no blood entering the system, all right? There is no opening where the blood is in communication with any other circulatory system. There can be exchange, right? There can be exchange or diffusion through this circulatory system, but there's no point where the blood can exit unless you have a cut or a bleed or there's a tear in any of the vessels. This is considered a closed system where the blood is moving in this in a circular fashion, continually, there's no blood entering or leaving this system. Okay, um, next we'll look at the blood composition. So blood is gonna be the final component of the cardiovascular system. And blood is made of um, a lot of other smaller components that actually make up what we know to be the blood. First of all, we've got the erythrocytes. And the erythrocytes are the red blood cells. These are the uh, cells that are carrying the oxygen and carbon dioxide that are actually transporting these gases in the blood. Okay, these make up about 45% of our total blood volume. Then we've got the leukocytes. Leukocytes are gonna be our white blood cells. And the function of leukocytes is really that defense role. It's gonna be a part of the immune system. These are gonna be the cells that help to fight infections, whether it be viral, um, fungal, bacteria. These cells help to defend our body against um, foreign pathogens. Um, and the leukocytes make up, together with platelets, less than 1% of our total blood volume unless you're actively fighting an infection where you can see these leukocyte numbers rise higher. Um, platelets are gonna be cell fragments, so they are important for blood clotting, but I really wanna stress that platelet platelets are not cells. They don't have a nucleus, they're not functioning as cells, um, they're not actively replicating or dividing, they're simply a cell that develops, which is called um, 
a megakaryocyte, and then that cell fragments, and it pretty much exploded and left behind all these smaller cellular fragments. And so these are vital in terms of clotting our blood. So, right, so they help to prevent bleeding out or excess bleeding. If you have a cut or a paper cut or any type of injury to your vessel, the um, clotting fragments help to stop that bleeding by depositing at the site of the injury and, um, and creating a clot to sort of stop that blood flow. Lastly is the plasma. This is the fluid or watery component of the blood. Here we're going to have things like electrolytes, other solutes um, that, are, um, that are dissolved or dissociated in that watery component. Um, and then that is going to be about 55% of our total blood volume. So if you were to take a liter of blood, right, let's say you went to your, did you went to the physician to do your annual blood work, they um, stick one of your veins, right? Remember blood is taken from the veins um, and they select a tube of blood and they send that off for testing. They would actually put that into a machine called a centrifuge, which is where they spin it at a really high volume. And that helps to actually separate some of these components that we're looking at. So after they spin it, they're going to separate all of the plasma, which is the watery component on the top. There's going to be a layer in the middle that's called a buffy coat, which is sort of how these um, components get separated out by density. And then at the very bottom is going to be the more dense components, which is the uh, erythrocytes. And then we have the white blood cells and then the platelets together. So these components are typically well mixed in our blood so that we can't really see them with the visual um, eye. We can't really see them with the naked eye. But if we were to um, do the centrifuge process, we can certainly separate them out and see them separately. All right. Um, let's look at the flow of blood. So the path that blood takes um, we reviewed this earlier, but let's talk about the two different circuits a little bit more. So the pulmonary circuit is supplied by the right side of the heart. Blood leaving the right ventricle goes into the pulmonary artery, goes to the lungs. Why does it go to the lungs? To pick up fresh oxygen. From the lungs, it's going to go back to the left side of the heart. Now it's going to go to the systemic circulation. So it's gonna leave the left side of the heart and go out into the systemic circulation. And here it's going to deliver oxygen that was picked up in the lungs out to all of our peripheral tissues. So we wanna think about two different types of flow happening here. There is series flow through the cardiovascular system, meaning that blood is going in a series. So it's going from left atrium, systemic circulation, right uh, atrium, right ventricle, back to the lungs, and then back to the left atrium. And so the word series here means that it's happening one after the other, right? Heart, systemic, heart, pulmonary. Heart, systemic, heart, pulmonary. So that is a series uh, way of flowing through the entire cardiovascular system. But if we think about within the systemic system or within the pulmonary system. We can describe the blood flow in these individual systems as being a parallel type of flow, okay? So parallel means that when blood leaves the right side of the heart, when blood leaves the right ventricle and it gets to the pulmonary artery, all of the blood doesn't go to your left lung and then all of the blood goes to your right lung. That's not what happens. The blood divides at this point. So at the pulmonary artery, we've got two of them, we've got one left artery, one right artery. The blood takes a divisive path where a half of it goes to the right lung and half of it goes to the left lung. And so in that way, within the pulmonary part of the circuit, we can describe this as a parallel flow. Okay, same is true for the systemic circuit. When blood leaves the left ventricle and goes into the aorta, all of your blood doesn't go to your head and then all of your blood to your upper limb and then all of your blood to your abdomen and then all of your blood to your lower limbs. That doesn't happen. Some of the blood goes to your upper limb. Some of the blood goes to your head and neck. Some of it goes to your abdomen and then some of it goes to your lower limb. So within the systemic circulation as an individual unit, blood is flowing in a parallel path where some of the blood goes in different directions.
right? The blood begins to divide at this point. So just to illustrate again here, the difference between the uh, parallel flow and the series flow. So if we took the entire circulatory system, the entire cardiovascular system, blood would be considered to be flowing in a series fashion. So from the lungs collectively, to the heart collectively, to the body collectively, back to the heart and then back to the lungs. That general, more holistic view of the system is considered a series flow. But then if we were to zoom in a little bit more and look specifically at the pulmonary circulation, blood is going to the left lung and the right lung, right? So there's parallel flow happening. One uh, pa part of this is going to the left lung, one part of this is going to the right lung, right? In order to pick up the oxygen here. Again, if we took the systemic circulation and looked at it more closely, we see that the blood has a couple different paths, right? A couple different parallel options to flow. Some of it can go to your liver, some of it can go to your kidney, some of it can go to your brain, some of it can go to your eyes, right? From any number of uh, options or systems, all of that will be considered a parallel type of flow within the smaller systemic circulation. Okay. All right. Um, so just to describe these here a little bit more, the uh, cardiovascular system as a whole is a closed system. And as a whole, it is a series type of flow. Blood is moving through the systemic circulation, followed by the heart, followed by the pulmonary circulation, followed by the heart again. And the reason we call this a series flow, because all of the blood must go to each of these spots. All of the blood in your body must come to the heart, must go to the lungs, must go out to your body as a whole, and then must come back to your heart again. So blood doesn't have an option. It has to go to the lungs, has to go to the heart, has to go to the body. Alternatively, parallel now is where blood has options. It has different routes that it can take depending on the different types of organ systems. So it's gonna go out into your arteries, into your arterioles, into your capillaries, then into your capillary beds. And then here in either the pulmonary system or the systemic system, it's gonna have an option as to where it can go. So it can go to the right lung or the left lung. Okay, in the pulmonary circulation. In the systemic circulation, it can go to your brain. Some of it can go to your heart, to your GI tract. Some can go to your kidneys, et cetera, et cetera. So here we describe this as a parallel flow. Right. Now, within that parallel flow, there is also the coronary circulation. So it is tempting to think that the heart is a muscle, right? It's got blood in the chambers. And so one would be tempted to think that, hey, the heart is just going to absorb oxygen through the chambers and supply itself with oxygen. But that is not actually true. The way that the heart gets its own oxygen is by smaller, tiny blood vessels that are actually running on the outer surface of the heart. These blood vessels are called the coronary arteries or the coronary circulation. So the coronary circulation is one of the options that blood takes as a part of the parallel circuit um, as it leaves the aorta here. And so we can think about the heart as being quite selfish in this way, right? So it's gonna take the very first bit of blood, um, the two arteries that are branching from the very um, uh, base of the ascending aorta here are the right and left coronary arteries. And so the heart takes its own blood to get its own oxygen as the first branch coming off of the aorta, right? It wants to get its own oxygen first before any of that blood can be delivered anywhere else. Okay, so the capillaries that supply the uh, right and left coronary arteries come right from the aorta and they help to deliver the oxygen and nutrients to the heart muscle itself. So this is where we can get into things like coronary artery um, blockages, right? So if you have a heart attack, this, these are the blood vessels that are blocked, um, either from atherosclerosis, which is a blockage of the vessel, or from things like extremely high blood pressure, which is where that 
pressure actually starts to um, injure or tear or weaken these blood vessels. So when we have a blockage or a tear in any of the coronary arteries, this is where the heart loses oxygen. A part of the heart may even die. And this is what we call a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, right? What we commonly know as a heart attack. So it's really important to, um, to uh, evaluate the health of the coronary circulation, especially in individuals who have diabetes or have high blood pressure, who have a higher likelihood of having some sort of um, abnormality or blockage or disease of these coronary vessels. We want to make sure that they aren't at, at increased risk for developing heart attacks. And the same thing is true in the brain, right? The brain is another very vulnerable area where these small blood vessels can um, become blocked or tear and can result in strokes. Okay, um, let's talk some more about the other parts of the anatomy here quickly. So we've got the heart, it's in the center of the thoracic cavity. It's typically about the size of a fist. So it will be differing uh, depending on your body um, habitus, right? If you're a larger individual, male, you might have a bigger fist, therefore a bigger heart. If you're a smaller individual, um, um, maybe you're a female or even a child, you may have a smaller fist and therefore a smaller heart. Um, it is separated in the uh, thoracic cavity by the lungs. So the lungs are on either side here of the heart. And then it's within a, a sac. It's called the pericardium or the pericardial sac. And what this sac does is it has a small amount of fluid in between the layers, and that helps to provide some lubrication. So as the diaphragm is moving, so the diaphragm is down here, it's moving with respiration. The lungs are also moving with respiration. And so there's a lot of movement happening in the thoracic cavity. And so that pericardial sac and the fluid in that sac helps to provide some lubrication so that there's frictionless movement with respiration. Um, if we look more internally at the heart itself, the layers of the heart muscle, we've got three layers. The outermost layer is the epicardium. The middle thickest layer is the actual myocardium. This is where we have the actual myocardial cells that we'll talk some more about later on. And then the inner thinnest layer is the endothelium. And so when we talk about the endothelium here, this is where we have a very similar appearance of the heart to any other blood vessel in the body. And as I mentioned earlier, the heart develops as a blood vessel. And so the layer internally, uh, the endothelium is very similar to the layers of blood vessels that we see. Okay, I also wanna point out that the myocardium on the left side of the heart is significantly thicker. So notice how the left ventricle is extremely thick here on the left versus that much thinner um, muscular wall on the right. And this is mainly due to the vascular resistance. So the left side of the heart has to pump blood out against all of the systemic vascular resistance, right? So it's gonna have a lot more of a harder job to do uh, or more work to do to create the force that allows blood to go all throughout our peripheral circulation. And so it's gonna have to work more harder, work harder. And so it's gonna have um, a thicker appearance than the right. Um, now, just to talk about the valves here, valves help to make sure that blood is flowing in one direction. The uh, valves open and close as, um, as they honor the pressure gradients across the chambers. So it would be tempting to think that valves are muscular, right? That valves can open or close. They are not, valves are not muscular. They are not contractile units. They are simply opening when the pressure in the preceding chamber is higher than the pressure in the subsequent chamber. So when the pressure in my left atria is higher than the pressure in my left ventricle, my bicuspid valve would naturally open. So the pressure gradient across chambers is what allows the valves to open and close. And the blood is always going to be moving from a high pressure to a low pressure. Um, and so we've got our uh, semilunar valves, which are in between the, uh, oh, sorry, that, let's start with the AV valves. The AV valves are in between the atria and the ventricle. So on the right side, we have the tricuspid valve. On the left side, we have the bicuspid valve. And the bicuspid valve is often called a mitral valve. 
just because it looks like the um, mitra, right? The bishop's hat. If you play chess at all, you'll know that the um, bishop piece um, is also shaped that way. Um, so that that shape is given to that shape helps to give this valve its name, but it is also sometimes called the mitral valve as well. Um, the papillary muscles are the muscles that are sticking up from the ventricular wall. So these finger like projections here that are attaching to the cords of the valves, these are called the papillary muscle. And then the cord tendinae are the actual cords, these white fibrous cords that are projecting from the papillary muscle and then anchoring on to the leaflets of the valve. So together, these three structures, the papillary muscle of the ventricle, the cord tendinae of the valve, and the actual leaflets of the valve help to prevent the blood from going back into the preceding chamber and make sure that blood is only flowing in one direction. So when the papillary muscle is contracted, as it is here on the right, the cords are pulled down, the valve is held in place, like tight shut, and this is allowing the pressure in the ventricle to rise without forcing the blood back up into the atria. Uh, alternatively, on the left, when the papillary muscle is relaxed, when the, ventricle is re when the ventricle is relaxed, the fibrous cords are a little bit more floppy, right? They're not as tense. The valve leaflets are open, and so the ventricle is relaxing, and then blood can also move down into the atria. Okay, um, so here are the semilunar valves. These are the aortic and pulmonary valves. So the aortic valve is in between the aorta. And I've got this little gif going here just to kind of illustrate what's happening. So the aortic valve helps blood to go from left ventricle out into the aorta, out into the vascular systemic circulation. The pulmonary valve on the right side of the heart helps blood to go from the right ventricle out into the pulmonary artery and then out into the lungs. Okay, and these are our semi-lunar